Today, Orlando is home to multiple water parks, from Typhoon Lagoon to Volcano Bay. However, one water park, located on 192, just 1.5 miles from Disney, operated for 20 years before becoming abandoned and forgotten. This is the story of Watermania. There's something big going on in Orlando. Water Mania, Florida's water theme park. Orlando is the birthplace of the modern water park. While Walt Disney World opened an old-fashioned swimming hole with slides in 1975, it would be SeaWorld creator George Millay who would adapt the idea into a fully-fledged full water park in 1977. The park stemmed from the realization that spending time in SeaWorld could be really hot. What do you naturally think of when really hot? Well, cooling off in a water park, of course. Wet n Wild was inspired by the splash pad at Ontario Place in Toronto, along with the wave pool at Point Mallard Park in Alabama. Wet n Wild Orlando would bring slides, pools, and a full day out with a separately ticketed water park experience to the central Florida area. What's a Wet n Wild? Oh, it's a hair raisin. Mind blowing. Red Teddy. Sun bacon. Eye popping. Wave hopping. Play all day and never stopping. Slow moving. Light over the following decade, the park would expand greatly. It wouldn't be long until Disney would follow suit. Disney's new water park wouldn't be the second in the area, however, but the third. In the summer of 1986, just a few miles from Walt Disney World, Watermania would open. 36 acres of thrills and spills for the entire family, seven days a week. Bob and Iris Larson moved to the Kissimmee area in 1958. With a strong work ethic, over the years, they became well-known in the local community, originally opening a plant that made plastic drainage pipes. The 1965 Walt Disney announcement that they would bring a theme park to the area would spark many changes for Osceola County residents. Soon, the area would have a huge boost of visitors, which led to many entrepreneurs to take new paths with new opportunities. No more so than Bob and Iris Larson. In 1973, the couple secured a $1.25 million bank loan to build a 120-room hotel known as the Red Carpet Inn. While today, hundreds of hotels could be found in the area, in the 70s, hotels were much more limited. The original hotel, located on Vine Street in Kissimmee, was an instant success. And not long after opening, they would break away from the Red Carpet Inn franchise and create their own independent hotel company, known as the Larson's Lodges. Later, in 1978, they would open a second Larson's Hotel, this time just 1.5 miles from Walt Disney World. They were not done yet, though, and in August 1986, Following in Wet n Wild's footsteps, they opened the area's second major water park, not counting River Country. River Country, big river country, it's a hoop, it's a holler, it's a water jamboree. Located in Kissimmee at 6073 West Erlo Bronson Highway, or US 192, right next to I-4 and directly across from what would later become Celebration, the 37-acre park, while smaller than Wet n Wild, offered an alternative to the extremely busy water park that inspired it. Watermania started strong. Within its gates, multiple attractions could be found. The wave pool, called White Caps, at 720,000 gallons of water, was the largest in the region. Other attractions included twin tornadoes, two flumes where guests could choose which one they wanted to head down the 320 feet on a mat, the Screamer, a free fall 72 foot slide, the Double Berserker, which featured double dips, the Abyss, a closed dark blue 380 foot long slide, as well as the Banana Peel, a family two person tube slide. There was, of course, a lazy river. 
here called Cruising Creek, offering an 850 foot tropical experience that winded throughout the park. Watermania also featured a large picnic area, known as the Great American Picnic Area, or later, the Woods. It was a three acre retreat to get away from the hustle and bustle of the water park that included a playground and sports courts. A large effort was used to attract sports teams and schools to the park. Many local residents were given coupon tickets and local school trips were frequent visitors to Watermania. The park was an instant success with locals, as well as visitors to the rapidly growing tourist area. Just a few years after opening, when Typhoon Lagoon opened in 1989, Public Relations Director for Watermania was asked about the latest Disney park. The response was that we really don't see Typhoon Lagoon affecting us at all. We have competitive emission prices and have more slides than they do. Watermania had 11. Typhoon Lagoon only had 8. 1988 had been extremely popular for Watermania and they did not think the addition of this new Disney park would change that. Surprisingly, it didn't and the park only became more popular in the 90s. In 1989, the park expanded with a new slide, this time a 14-foot wide slide designed for families. Costing $600,000, the park's 12th slide would be 45 feet high and called the Anaconda. Constant additions were the plan to bring new guests into the park, as well as help compete against Wet n Wild, Typhoon Lagoon, and the Fun n Wheels Fun Park that was nearby. Again, it worked, and attendance increased 55% from the year before. For the first few years, the water park even hosted a Halloween event called the Haunted Forest. Located in the woods behind the park, guests would head down a dark, winding path full of ghosts and ghouls. It was presented in conjunction with Gateway High School and benefited their theatre department. 1992 saw the park get a new attraction, called Wipeout. Designed by veteran Californian surfer Tom Lochfeld, it was the second such ride in the country. A surfing attraction that anyone could enjoy, not just practice surfers. Wipeout simulated a surfing wave by pumping 35,000 gallons of water per minute up an inclined ramp forming a continuous surfable wave, which could then be body surfed by guests in the park, at least until they would wipe out, hence the name, get it? Wipe out, yeah. The attraction was extremely popular, allowing 500 people every hour to ride. To be able to do this, you had to be as tall as a standard boogie board. Personally, I don't know how tall that is, but I'm sure they had one to check. Throughout the 90s, the park became more and more popular, with over 500,000 guests visiting each year. In the earlier years, the park would even be home to concerts as well. Next to the wave pool, artists such as Warren, Greg Allman, Steppenwolf, Ted Nugent, and Bad Company performed in the early years. Competition would become even fiercer when Disney would open Blizzard Beach in 1995. This new park would break water park records and be extremely popular. Watermania would focus on their local audience and offer multiple deals and coupons throughout the year to keep enticing people in. They were cornering a different market to what the larger parks would offer. 1996 saw the park advertise it was getting a facelift. The ride that was originally called Looney Flume was refurbished, and the Abyss added a second channel along with the pool being resurfaced. After this, however, investments began to decline and less and less was added to the park. A water coaster was proposed, along with a wind tunnel to simulate rainstorms and a hurricane. Not really something that was needed for Florida. Neither of these ever happened. In 1992, some of the land the park was on transferred to the Larson's couple's children, including Gary Larson, who was the general manager of the park. His brother Randy would take over and operate the Larson hotels. And two days after the land was gifted, the couple sold the Romanian Watermania land to Watermania Inc. for $3 million. The president of the new company would be Gary Larson one of the couple's three children, and now joint owner of the park along with his brother. Park attendance would decline in 1997 when an accident at the park contributed to the death of an employee who was repairing the park's wave machine for the pool. The sadly grisly death occurred as the employee was sucked into the wave machine's turbine. 
The incident occurred during park hours, but was inside a building out of sight. The park was closed and guests were asked to leave the pool. Watermania was fined $15,590 by the Occupational Health and Safety Administration for 34 safety violations, many of which were considered so serious that they could have led to death. They were given 30 days to fix them all and the employee's family sued the park. Watermania would remain open with little major investment throughout the early 2000s. After operating for 10 years as a year-round park, Watermania would close over the winter as guests began to dry up. The park would open the following year, scaling back concessions and food offerings, along with a reduction in staff. They decided that they would add some classic 192 experiences that would stay open year-round. This included a go-kart track, mini golf, and an arcade. Those who had tickets for the shortly announced closed period were allowed to use them at the arcade, Church Street Station, or Cypress Gardens, none of which really exist anymore. The park stated this new approach would help with their niche of locals visiting and help them to stay competitive into the future. Following the 2001 September 11th attacks, the park began to struggle. With the huge decline in tourism around the country, the park would only open on select weekends. Co-owner Gary Larson, however, was able to offer some of the displaced employees jobs at Eagle Wings, another company the family owned, which made neckties. Watermania had begun to look quite run down. Residents of the now-built Celebration were not fans of seeing it every time they headed home. 2003 did see a new addition to the park, a 25-foot-high climbing wall that would drop water on your face. The park called it cooling as well as fun. Definitely very cool. A huge blow would hit the park in 2004, Hurricane Charlie. The 2004 hurricane season was a bad one for Florida, and Charlie left large amounts of destruction at Watermania. Signs were torn down and canopies were blown away. Seven large oak trees were knocked over and the slides were damaged. The park sustained $100,000 worth of damage, along with losing power for 24 hours. Watermania was closed for over a week and it took two days just to clear the debris from the wave pool. It was inspected and reopened with some attractions remaining closed. One of the slides called the Screamer was destroyed. Over the closed season, in time for the park's 20th anniversary in 2005, the slide was rebuilt. Less than a year later, Watermania would be closed and abandoned. After operating for its final 20th season, it was announced in August 2005 that Watermania would close for good on September 5th. The owners were approached by a private buyer back in January 2005 to purchase the land that the hotel and water park was on. They stated it was not due to lack of business, as they had just had their best July ever. They had decided the time was right to move on. Some of the 96 employees would be moved to other companies owned by the Larsons, and those that were not were helped to find further employment, many at Wet n Wild. Those that had single day tickets and season passes for Watermania were able to be used for a mission to Wet n Wild instead. It was reported that Wet n Wild had not lost its cool like Watermania. The site remained abandoned for one year before being demolished in 2006 and replaced with a Golden Corral and Pirates Island mini golf. The back section of the former park was later turned into Camden Town Square Apartments, which today uses the old go-kart sign to advertise the apartment complex. The mini golf stuck around for a couple of years before being replaced by a hotel. As for the Larson's Lodge main gate, it later became the Park Inn and Suites until the majority of it was knocked down and the front area was converted to a CVS. Its contents were liquidated in December 2005. Today, very little remains of the Watermania water park. Its location on 192 now features abandoned hotels and chain restaurants sitting in its place. In the 16 years since its closure, there are many who look back at the park fondly as a place they visited multiple times and had incredible memories during their visits. It wasn't as big, flashy, or even most likely as safe as some of the other water parks in the area. The park definitely had that local Kissimmee charm. 
but it sure could offer a lot of fun for those who spent time there, even in its later slightly rundown state. Over time though, Watermania has become Orlando's forgotten water park. Watermania, Florida's water theme park, located a half mile east of I-4 on Highway 192 in Kissimmee. Gary Larson said he is proud that a family-owned company such as his had been able to be successful in the area's tourism industry for so long. If you look at the history of the smaller tourist attractions in the area after Disney opened, a 20-year operation is quite the feat. Sadly, throughout the decades, it has been harder and harder for smaller operations to continue to compete with the larger company's offerings. Bob Larson passed away the same year the park was sold in 2005. He had worked his whole life to create a business for his family. He overcame many hardships during his life, but never stopped pushing forward, forging their way into the legacy of Kissimmee tourism. Bob and Iris Larson would become known as Osceola's first family of tourism, later being inducted into Florida's Tourism Hall of Fame. Gary Larson said when asked that while the family business would go in a different direction from the water park, they would continue to love tourism and have been successful in it for 30 years. It was in the Larson's blood. Iris said that running a business isn't about how deep your pockets are. You've got to have the ability to dream. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Expedition Extinct. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to join the expedition. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates on upcoming episodes. And a special thank you to our patrons for supporting the channel. What is your favorite Orlando water park? Let me know in the comments below. We will see you next time.